Okay, um, so this is Run For Your Life, lesson five I think we're on to now. Um, so far we've looked at the skeleton and joints, we've looked at muscles and slide and filament theory, we've looked at respirations of chemiosmosis and glycolysis, Krebs cycle and transport chain, and now kind of carrying on from that we're looking at first of all energy density which is how um, different substrates for respiration have different levels of energy and how we measure that and then secondly something called respirometry which is a key practical that you're going to do uh, in the lab next lesson so outcomes for the first part um, if we start here A grade really it's meant to, meant to be an A explaining why lipids have a higher energy density than carbohydrates so saying why that is the case for B grade um, we're going to describe in how other substrates are respired, so where they feed in to respiration overall. And then remembering for, for C grade that some cells can only use glucose for respiration, which we'll talk about shortly. So, those some cells I'm talking about, neurons in the brain in particular, um, red blood cells as well, and lymphocytes, which are white blood cells which we dealt with in the previous module, they all have to have glucose as their respiratory substrate. Um, other cells can use lipids, which is fats, and amino acids, obviously, which come from proteins. They can use those as a fuel. Um, you know already that most of the energy from aerobic respiration, which you found, would have found from your demonstrated task last lesson, most of it comes from the oxidation of hydrogen to water um, when NAD and FAD are passed through the electron transport chain. So that oxidative phosphorylation that you made the table for last week that's where most of the energy comes from. If you remember, very, very little gained through um, glycolysis, the link reaction, Krebs cycle itself. Most of the energy, most of the ATP, is made from the electron transport chain. Now, what goes in the electron transport chain is hydrogen. And so, the more hydrogen you have in a structure, a substrate, the more energy that can be made. That makes sense, doesn't it? If you feed something into respiration that has more hydrogens, you're going to create more NA, reduce NAD, which is going to feed more hydrogens into the electron transport chain and therefore produce more ATP. Okay, now you may or may not remember from, from year 12 that fats, lipids, um, have a lot more hydrogen in their structure than carbohydrates. So therefore, as I said on the last slide, they have a greater energy density. If you remember their structure, which is down the bottom right here, they're, they're made of glycerol and then you've got these three fatty acid chains, so that's what we'll call a triglyceride. So how this works, basically the carbon atoms are removed from this chain. Okay, They're removed in pairs and then they're fed in a Krebs cycle where acetylcoenzyme A would normally go in. So at the top, joining oxaloacetate with acetylcoenzyme A and then to, sit, to form citrate, that's where all the carbons from these fatty acid chains are going to be fed in. The glycerol actually goes into glycolysis is one of the three carbon intermediates, so um, GALP, if you remember, or um, glycerate 3-phosphate, is what we, we, we called it, um, your glycerol can go into there. If you have a look on page 152 in your textbook, um, it shows what I'm talking about there. You'll see there's a diagram, it's one of those blue did you know boxes. Have a quick look at that, and that just shows how it all, how it all feeds into the Krebs cycle. Proteins, as you can see here, they've got less hydrogen atoms than, than lipids, so they are going to have a lower energy density. Hence, you know, fatty foods, foods with, with fat in them, have got a greater calorific content. If you look at the packages and of things that you're eating, far more energy in something that's fatty than something that's high in protein or high in carbs. Um, in order to aspire them, the, the, the skeleton, the backbone of, of the proteins has to be broken down. Um, and again, that's then going to be turned into pyruvate or acetylcoenzyme A and then it's going to feed into the Krebs cycle from there. If you were to, to measure that energy, um, you'd use something called the calorimeter, um, which I've put here, you use something called the calorimeter, um, that would show you how much energy is in each of those different substrates. You, you've, you've probably done this further down school, um, I don't know if you remember burning crisps um, in your 7 or 8 or something like that and you basically had a cup of water or a bunch of water and you burn the Christmas scene how much it affected the temperature that, that, that's a fairly crude version of what's called a bomb calorimeter. But you can see from the table if you were to do that um, carbohydrates they're coming in with 
well, 15.8 kilojoules per gram. Proteins, 17 kilojoules per gram. And then your lipids, bosonate, 39.4 kilojoules per gram. So that's nearly, well, more than double the amount you've got in your carbohydrates. So hence, it's much more energy dense. You're going to get far more calories from that, far more energy out of it. Um, hopefully, on the next slide, I can show you roughly what a calor calorimeter does. So just look at the diagram, like I said, you, you probably did this lower down scale. You would use a much more compl complex version of this if we were to do it in the lab, but I can't actually see that it's in your specification, so I'm not going to spend too long on it, but um, if you want me to show you in the lab, I'm going to do that later on. Basically what you would have, I've got a spirit burner here, but you'd have your food here, and you set fire to it, you've got your beaker, filled with water, a set, you know, a set volume of water that that's all measured, and you've got your thermometer, and you're measuring the temperature of the water before you set fire to the food, the temperature of the water after you set fire to the food, and then the difference shows you the energy that's been um, liberated from that food. And, and, and the greater the energy density of the food, the greater the energy change is going to be. Okay, so that's calorimetry. Um, next up, a bit of respirometry. So what we're looking at here is how we can actually measure the rate of respiration and also work out what substrate an organism is using. I know you probably, I know at least one of you has looked at this for your uh, for your coursework, so it'll be old news to you, but for the rest of you, but this is one of the key practicals that we're going to carry out um, in the next lesson. So hopefully from um, GCSE you might remember a little bit about RQ respiratory quotient which is the ratio between the oxygen that's consumed when you're respiring a substrate and the carbon dioxide that is given out. Um, for some reason the subscript scripts don't work and so I apologise for each of those there but your basically um, your basic respiration equation you've got glucose plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water you know that C6H12O6 plus 6O2 makes 6CO2 and 6H2O. Um, in terms of the oxygen molecules that are consumed, well, you've got six. Six carbon dioxide given out. So the ratio is, well, it's one to one, isn't it? So the RQ is one to one. And for all carbohydrates, the, the RQ is one. Um, but it varies depending on which substrate it is. So for the RQ then, respiratory quotient, basically you're dividing the volume of oxygen that is given out. So the volume of carbon dioxide that is given out. You're dividing that by the volume of oxygen that's consumed. So oxygen taken in, carbon dioxide given out, divide carbon dioxide given out by the oxygen taken in, that gives you your RQ. And like I said, for, for carbohydrates, that's that's pretty much always uh, one. Um, and then it varies for, for fats and for proteins. So fats tend to be 0 0.7, and proteins tend to be 0 0.9. Okay, uh, like I said, this doesn't seem to appear in your spec, but respirometry does, so it might it might be there. You've certainly done this at GCSE, so um, it's not the end of the world to just recap over that. Okay, so this is what a respirometer looks like. Um, they come in various shapes and sizes, I suppose, but the key thing is that you have two sides to it. So if I just draw a line down the middle, you've basically got your experimental side over here. And then you've got your control side on this side. So when you look, there's your organisms. Okay, they only appear in that side. Often over here, you would just have some glass beads or something, just something in there, um, just to act as the as the organism on this side. And obviously, that's not going to consume any oxygen or produce any carbon dioxide. But it shows that there is a a control aspect to it. Okay, so a couple of things to note. Um, you always have, well, depending on the experiment you're doing, but pretty much always will have a carbon, diox carbon dioxide absorber in this side. So any carbon dioxide produced by the invertebrates is absorbed. So in this case, potassium hydroxide. And that might be a solution or it might be um, it might be in a solid form or whatever, but it'll be there to absorb carbon dioxide. So the idea is that as the organisms are aspiring, they're taking in oxygen and they're... they're respiring and therefore then breathing out carbon dioxide that carbon dioxide is absorbed by this and so the overall volume of gas in this in this half of the the, the system is going to decrease 
because they've taken oxygen out of it, they've replaced with carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide has been absorbed into the carbon dioxide absorber here, which means less gas in this half of the system. So if there's less gas, here you've got a manometer, so that's basically um, a thin tube containing fluid. Now what will happen if they're respiring and they're producing carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide has been absorbed, that manometer is going to rise up in this direction because there's a smaller volume of oxygen in this half. So you can use that to measure the rate of respiration for example, so how quickly are they producing carbon dioxide and therefore how quickly are they absorbing oxygen. So you could use that to measure the rate, how quickly is it occurring. Obviously from there on you can alter the conditions, so you may want to alter the temperature, you may want to alter whatever food they've got, the, the light intensity, whatever, whatever it is you think is going to affect the rate of respiration, you could then alter and you'd measure the difference in, in how far this manometer moves over a given period of time. If you were going to use a to work to work out um, the RQ, then you need to do two tests. Basically that first test that I just described, we'll call test A, um, because what that shows you is how much oxygen has been used. Likewise, it's how much carbon dioxide was produced, but it's also how, how much oxygen was consumed. I think you do another test, but this time without the carbon dioxide absorber, so the potassium hydroxide or whatever whatever it is you've got in there. Um, and then that would show you if there's a difference. So if there's a difference between the amount of carbon dioxide used, uh, the amount of oxygen used and the amount of carbon dioxide produced. With carbohydrates, there's no difference. If you remember, the ratio is one to one. So the manometer in this experiment, if it was respiring carbohydrates, wouldn't move anywhere. But if it was respiring protein or fat, then there's a difference, isn't there? In terms of the oxygen that's used and the carbon dioxide that's produced, so the manometer would move in that case. And so to work out the RQ, you would do this. You take your result from the first experiment, take away the result from the second experiment, divide by the results from the first, and that will give you RQ. Again, I've not seen this in your spec but it's not you know it, 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 there's no harm in knowing it necessarily okay so for the next lesson you're gonna have to carry out the key practical which is using a respirometer so you need to come into the lesson being familiar with the setup of it you, you'll not get it set up like this you'll need to put this together yourself so you the, the, basically you won't have the boiling tube heat ups you won't have the boiling tube secured to the manometer here no without one so what you'll need to do is put the dye, the manometer fluid, this that's in here, using the hypodermic syringe, you'll need to put that into um, the manometer here. You need to set up your two boiling tubes, you, you'll have like a gauze on here, which the organism, whichever organism we use, goes onto. It might not be little crawlies, so don't worry. Uh, it could be a plant or you know a seed or whatever. Likewise, you'll have another gauze in here with a control. Your carbon dioxide absorber. As we said, and your syringe, we might have syringes on both ends and we'll probably have a three-way tap here and a three-way tap here as well so that we can adjust the levels of gas within the system so that we get a nice level manometer fluid here. Okay, And then what you'll do is you'll set up different conditions and see if we can measure the rate of respiration, the rate of oxygen consumption um, in different conditions. It is fiddly and it is tricky. The key thing is, is like I said, to get that manometer fluid in with all your taps open so that you can then seal the taps. Well, just where the manometer fluid is using a syringe and then seal the taps so that you, it's in a steady position. Um, it is tricky, but like I said, it's the key part of it. It's one that we've got to do. We've got a marquee on it. So have a look at this. Make sure it's fairly clear in your mind what it is you need to do before you come into the lesson. And I'm sure we should be all right from there. Okay, this is a quick YouTube clip to, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about in terms of how you're going to set your experiment up. It's quite slow, um, but obviously feel free to, to skip through if needs be. It shows you the kind of experiment we're going to be using. Most of your internet search will show you a much more basic one than the one that we're going to use. Um, so have a look, by all means, um, and then at the end it does show you how you could possibly adjust the temperature if that's what you're going to investigate.
that bit often goes wrong, just bear that in mind. Because we use rubber tubing, any kind of adjustment, any any movement of the vespirometer can often adjust where the manometer fluid is, so you've got to be a bit careful of that. 